Hey, everyone. Before we get into today's interview, just wanted to drop a little reminder to stay up to date with all the latest episodes of On The Margin. You can subscribe to the BlockWorks Macro YouTube. Just go up there, just click the little uh, subscribe button, or you can click the links at the top of this episode. It'll take you over to Apple, Spotify, whatever your preferred platform is. Just subscribe there. And if you could, leave a rating and review. Really appreciate it. All right, on with the show. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On The Margin. Today, I am joined by repeat guest Cameron Dawson. Cameron, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, this will be a fun one. I thought actually we could kick things off by rewinding the clock a little bit. We just had Powell's Jackson Hole speech the other week. I thought we could actually rewind the clock back one year. Um, you wrote a really great piece about this, sort of a retrospective of Powell's shift from your perspective as Powell as a dove to Powell the Hawk. So maybe could you kind of just take us through what that transition looked like from your perspective and any takeaways that you had from the Jackson Hole speech last week? Yeah, maybe the way to put it is is there and back again, which of course is the subtitle to The Hobbit. Uh, but this idea that Powell started as a dove, became a hawk for a period of time, mostly during that 2022 Jackson Hole speech. And you can hear kind of the dove coming back out of him again. The reason you know, we talked a lot about this idea that the that Powell has always really wanted to be a dove. Look at the policy response in a time like 2018 and 2019 when he was cutting interest rates, despite the fact that we had employment, unemployment at a 50-year low. Look at the policy response in things like COVID, uh, the transitory argument of not raising rates, even despite the fact that inflation was, was moving up rather rapidly. And so 2022 was really a mode shift for him and coming out in his most hawkish kind of tone that he's ever struck. And that's when he warned of pain. He warned of sacrifice, the cost that it would take in order to fight inflation from an economic standpoint and saying to the average person of, hey, you might lose your job, but inflation is a much bigger risk. Now, of course, in warning about this pain, we're now a year past that point of all of the all of these warnings. And the reality is, is that the pain has not materialized, meaning that if you look at the jobs market, there's 3.2 million more people employed versus when he gave the speech in 2022. That hardly seems like pain. You've gone from the point where real wages, real income growth was deeply negative at that time, but now is turned firmly positive that just means that wage gains have made, remained robust despite the fact that inflation has come off the boil. And if we think from an overall economic standpoint, there, there was $1.3 trillion more of GDP created in the 12 months, in the last 12 months, than in the prior 12 months uh, when he gave that speech in 2022. So no evidence of pain. Of course, we can talk about how there's pockets of, of disruption, things like venture having a really tough year in 2022, mm -hmm. IPOs being down, uh, commercial real estate uh, uh, potentially having you know, bigger issues, of course, what happened with with the regional banking issues, but none of those things have morphed into being something that actually impacts the broader economy in a meaningful way. Even the regional banks, there's a lot of relation to what the Fed did and why they had issues, um, but it didn't create a credit crunch. It didn't create this warning yeah. of a recession credit crisis. So I think it's just really interesting in, in how even though we haven't seen that pain, Powell has really wanted to shift even more into that dovish ter territory, even though he's saying he's still a hawk. Yeah. So what what makes you think that? And I, I would love to, I feel like I'm asking very similar line of questioning every week now, but what do you make of this? So I'm actually, I'll, I'll just pull up this uh, this most recent estimate from the Fed's GDP now. Um, and it's been, you know, while it's not at the, let's call it the COVID highs, um, it still has remained pretty robust, uh, much more so than at least the, the consensus was. So, I mean, Cameron, what do you, what do you attribute this to? Just very curious. Why is this all playing out like this? Well, the reason for resilient growth uh, and why we can continue to have growth kind of above trend, despite the Fed's very rapid interest rate hiking cycle, we think has to do in part to, of course, the the kind of just rebalances coming out of COVID and how much stimulus there still is kind of 
in the system of money that was was issued and kind of is now just being spent, kind of the degree of fiscal support for this economy, I think was underappreciated by pretty much everybody going into 2023. There was an expectation for a fiscal drag, um, but given where deficits are today, and there's lots of debate about whether or not the deficits that we have are stimulative or not. And there was a journal, an article in the journal this weekend about that saying, oh, no, it's all just interest costs. Well, you know, one person's interest expense is another person's interest income. And that raises the other question about, yes, we know the government's paying more in interest income. We can see the surge in its interest costs. However, the key difference here is that if we're looking at the uh, the ex- interest expense by households and by corporations, what you see is the ability for these two cohorts, very important cohorts, to reduce their sensitivity to Fed interest rate hikes. And this process has been happening for 15 years, effectively. So coming out of the great financial crisis, the Fed pursues quantitative easing. Quantitative easing is different than any other policy that they ever pursued, because prior to that, they really focused on the front end of the curve. That's Mm -hmm. Fed funds rates, hikes, and and cuts. Uh, But QE allowed them to lower interest rates throughout the curve. 10, 30 years as they were buying bonds. You had all those operation twists happening back in in the early 10s. And what that allowed corporations and consumers to do is take advantage of very low long-term bonds in a way that you hadn't seen long yields that low in a very, very long time. And even in in, uh, the post-COVID era, record low long yields. And so when you have low long yields that allows people to reduce their reliance on short-term debt, it also allows them uh, to reduce their need to roll over their debt as much because they have this longer maturity uh, of debt. The end result is, as the Fed in- it raises interest rates, these cohorts of borrowers, consumers, and corporations don't have to refinance their debt as much. And they're actually far more agnostic about what the Fed is doing because they're not seeing their interest expense rise. So it's really interesting is because we've seen income stay rather resilient, interest expense for for corporations as a percentage of income has actually been falling despite the Fed's rate increase in interest rates. Mm. And if you look at the year over year change in interest income, it has not followed the typical path of where it usually rises as the Fed is raising interest rates. And the old, the whole reason is because these, these cohorts have termed out their debt. So I think that the resilience in the U.S. economy, uh, there's lots of reasons for it, of pent-up demand and excess saving, all these different pockets. But I think a big, a big part of it is the hangover or the long maybe unintended consequences of a decade plus of QE that effectively has reduced the economy's sensitivity to Fed rate hikes on the short end of the curve. Hey, everyone. We'll get back to the show in a minute, but just wanted to let you know that we've got our permissionless conference coming up. This is the one that we do with Bankless. It is the biggest and best conference in DeFi. It's going to be in Austin, Texas this year, September 11th through the 13th. Now, you've heard me say this many times on our show before, but the time to be bearish on crypto was 18 months ago when the Fed began raising rates. Since then, our entire market is down more than 50%. We've had all this bad news. In the last two weeks, we had BlackRock and a whole slew of other institutional investors file for the Bitcoin ETF. This space is not going anywhere. So if you're interested in investing in this space at all, I highly recommend that you attend this conference. The other thing, and I've said this before as well, brand market conferences are the best ones. In the fall market, you have all this retail, all this noise. Now you only have the people that are really here building great products. This one is worth your time 100%. And since you are such good listeners to On Margin, which I really appreciate, giving you all a special 30% discount code. It is Margin30. Now you can access that by clicking the link in the bottom of the show notes. So you can see my fingers pointing down, click that link. Because you are a listener of On The Margin, you get 30% off to the conference. Again, the code is MARGIN30. We'll see you all there. So, Cameron, one question that I always have when people give this argument about locking in longer term, uh, lower fixed rate debt uh, is, you know, there's a great quote from Chris Cole, which is that you can never destroy risk. You can only transform it. And, you know, whenever you're locking in uh, long term interest rates, someone is taking the other side of that bet, essentially. Uh, so my question is, who is it? It seems like if there's a winner, right, in the form of the consumer or corporates that refinanced at very low rates uh, over a long period of time, 
someone has to be on the other side of that trade. Someone has to be a loser. So do you have a sense of who that is? And is that ever going to be an issue? Or did we just create some sort of financial alchemy where everyone's kind of a winner here? <laughs> no, no. I mean, obviously, you know, it, it's the banks in one mm. aspect, right? So look at SVB. One of the reasons that they had issues is because they were the buyer of that long duration debt sitting on it as interest rates rose. They had big losses that were marked to market losses, not necessarily realized losses. And the Fed effectively did some form of alchemy by guaranteeing bank balance sheets that they could borrow against those bonds that they have on their balance sheet at par, acknowledging the fact that they are the losers in that equation of raising rising interest rates that other people have termed out borrowing. And that ability to use the bank term funding program said, hey, you might have a bond that's trading at, let's say it's you know, in theory, 70 cents on the dollar because interest rates have gone up so much, but you can borrow against it at 100 cents on the dollar. That was the response to the regional banking issues. So that's mm. one pocket of people who own it. Other people maybe are, are less sensitive to the paper losses that they might have because they do things called asset liability matching, meaning that if you are a pension fund, for example, you might have exposure to some of these bonds, but you're going to hold them through maturity um, because you're matching your liabilities with your assets. So maybe you're less sensitive to it. But I would say that it's really looking to the banks where some of these losses are being held. Um, and it's interesting, there was, uh, you know, the, the Fed also owns a lot of this debt as well, right? Think about it. I mean, the Fed also um, you know, was buying a lot of, of, of bonds from the government, obviously with treasuries, but also with mortgage-backed securities. Uh, but they, of course, are uneconomic buyers and owners. So uh, you know, they're not nearly facing the same degree of, of, of pain that other borrowers would or owners of debt would, would feel. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, of course, it's the uh, that's who I was sort of thinking as well as the commercial banking system. Also, central banks as well, right? Central banks were the big buyers of things like mortgage-backed securities, certainly well into the inflation uh, going through 2021. Um, w- one question that I had for you as well, Cameron, just while we're focused on sort of the strength of the consumer, there's been a lot of noise made recently about credit card debt. What we're looking at here is a chart of households adding to their Uh, credit card debt. And this tends to happen when the economy is strong and consumers feel confident, which leads to sort of a peak in credit card uh, spending on a household basis just before recession. And what folks are starting to ask is, is this a contrarian signal? And outside of their sort of managing the liabilities, uh, well, I guess this this also goes into managing the the liability of the consumer balance sheet, right? But just by adding credit card debt, this would be a sort of a way to stave off the inevitable and less of a, a good refinancing. But what, what do you think about the overall levels of credit card debt in the economy? And could this be a contrarian indicator that tells you that, hey, we might we might start to see a recession here pretty soon? Yeah, I think when we think about credit card debt, the thing that is eye-popping is the absolute levels. So of course, mm. what you can see here, what you're showing here is the incremental debt that's being added. But of course, if you look at the aggregate debt uh, surging to new highs uh, in recent months, of course, we had that drawdown during COVID because of all of the support and the lack of spending that was happening during the lockdowns. But now you're back at at, at very much new highs as it shot uh, uh really vertically higher pretty much in the past year as consumers return to borrowing from credit cards. The thing that will be the first pushback is that as a percentage of disposable income, however, credit card debt is below pre-COVID levels and well below where it was prior to the great financial crisis, meaning that consumers utilize revolving credit much more before the meltdown in consumer balance sheets in 07, 08, and 09, uh, which would suggest that it's not nearly as stretched as they have been in prior periods. Of course, indexing to the worst consumer credit crisis uh, of the last 100 years (laughs) is not necessarily helpful, right? We can still have an issue and have it not be the GFC, but the other point is, is that default rates uh, on consumer debt have been rebounding rather sharply. However, they are rebounding now just to their pre-COVID levels, mm. meaning that they're normalizing. They're not necessarily deteriorating in a way that we saw back in uh, 
0809, for example. Now, part of this is because about 70% of the totality of consumer borrowing is in mortgages. So if your mortgage is fixed rate and locked in at a low rate, you're not feeling that double whammy of higher interest rates on your credit cards at the same time as higher interest rates on your current mortgage which helps explain maybe some of this resilience and the lack of um, you know the the lack of defaults to a point where it's it, it where given the total level of debt you might expect but what i'd say is that those defaults are deteriorating rapidly uh if they continue to deteriorate it'll go beyond just normalization and go to something that looks to be a bit more nefarious uh, mm. But for now, if you listen to all the banks, they talk about this. They say, yeah, we're just getting back to pre-COVID levels at this point. The last point I'd say, and I think it's the most interesting, is how interest rates on credit cards are at an all-time high. And that's interesting mm. because your base rate on you know, your Fed funds rate, your index rate, whatever you want to, to, to look at, are have been, of course, higher in prior times in history but at over 20% on an average rate for credit cards. It's interesting that that's happening now when consumer balance sheets are, in theory, much healthier than they were, let's say, prior to the great financial crisis when consumer balance sheets were far worse um, and you had similar kind of base rates. So it, it is interesting how much um, you know, that's a, a profit center for, for, for these banks as we think about the, the source of, of those high interest rates. There's lots of theories as to why, they're, why they are so high, like points and, and how they pay for um, you know, those kind of perks. But uh, an interesting point that it's, it's at an all-time high, even above what it was in the 70s. Interesting. What what is what is your theory behind that? I mean, uh, I I actually I used to be a consultant in a past life. I'm a huge fan of the points myself. <laughs> I actually have uh, spreadsheets as well at some point over the years, just comparing different points and things like that. But why do you think the the rates are so high at the current moment? Yeah, that, that's the best theory that I've heard. Uh, mm-hmm. Is that it is because of all of the points and perks in order to win customers, and I think the. The real rub here, though, is that the people who are most likely to enjoy the points in aggregate are the people who are less likely to keep balances uh, and actually mm. pay the interest on the credit cards. Um, you know, and so it does raise the question of, you know, if you have a lower income cohort effectively subsidizing, you know, the increase in points. I I don't. I haven't seen good analysis of that if that's actually the case, but I think it's just it's it's eye popping to think that at a time that fintech was supposed to lower borrowing costs for people by being able to better underwrite consumer loans because we have better data and analysis and you can predict when people could default because of this reason and that reason. And so all of this big data is supposed to make consumer borrowing more exacting and be able to lower borrowing costs. Uh, at the same time as, you know, you have comparable base rates, the same time that consumer uh, balance sheets are supposed to be better. And yet we have we have these these all time high in in uh, overall rates, which would say that it's something other than those items uh, being the reason for for those high credit card rates. Yeah, it seem it does seem like a little bit of a shift to the, if not the lower income, definitely the less financially responsible. So basically, in order to attract new customers, you're raising the amount that you give back to customers in terms of points that has to factor into their margin somehow. It's just not being evenly distributed. It's just being distributed towards people that keep a keep a balance in their in their yeah. profile. So yeah, I guess that's that's probably not great depending on how you view it. But z- z- zooming out for a second, Cameron, one thing that's been pretty difficult to to square, at least from my perspective this year, is the policy. The, whether or not we we believe that Powell secretly wants to be a dove, his rhetoric has certainly been hawkish, and it's been very difficult to square the performance of the equity market, also even things like the housing market to what Powell is actually doing with his rate hikes and also the the verbiage that he's giving us. How do you sort of square the performance of financial assets this year, particularly the meteoric rise in the stock market since, uh, or at least year to date, with what Powell has been doing uh, from his seat at the Fed? Yeah, one of our our biggest surprises this year and about you know, what's driven and what's led this equity market is we went into the year thinking that the Fed mattered 
because it mattered a lot in 2020. It, well, actually, it mattered a lot in 2018, 2019, 2020, 21, 22. Mm. And thinking that the path of Fed policy would matter in 2023. And the way it would matter is that if the economy, as we expected, would stay stronger than expected, inflation would remain stickier than expected, that would drive higher for longer interest rates, and that would keep the Fed, um, you would, it would keep the number of rate hikes moving higher at the same time as you'd be pricing out those rate cuts, which if you remember going back at the beginning of the year, the market had rate cuts starting in July. And of course, you know, we're still hiking uh, in July. So clearly there was a very different path for the Fed than what was priced into the market at the beginning of the year. We expected that, but what we didn't expect is that at the same time that you saw tighter Fed pricing, that you would see in an absolute explosion in the valuation, mostly for long duration growth types of equities. And you know, looking back, you know, last week looked at saying the beginning of or at the end of March coming out of the COVID lows and kind of that pricing of the world's going to end, we're having a recession, the Fed's cutting interest rates. From that point up until last week, you saw the pricing for the December contract for the Fed funds futures go up by 170 basis points. That's saying 170 basis points more higher policy rate than what was expected in March. But coming out of that March low, the NASDAQ is up 36% in its PE valuation. And so that's a divergence that we haven't seen in mm. 18 through 22. And I think that's the biggest surprise and, and probably is, is related to you know, things like positioning. We did see a lot of selling of tax and growth all throughout 2022. And so there's definitely a, a catch up that had to happen. Um, but of course, then it's the narrative about, about AI. And it's also the strong earnings that came out of these names of they beat and raised and, and they took a lot of costs out of their businesses, really coming from the la later end of 22 into beginning 23. And so that that did allow for some good earnings op operating leverage. So you put it all together. And, and the, the interesting thing, though, is that you haven't seen a big revision higher in the earnings estimates even for you know the the names and the and the companies most related to some of these great trends, a name like Microsoft has seen this earnings estimates go up you know five to ten percent over the course of the next two years, and yet uh, the valuation is up 30, 40 percent. You know, going back to those those October lows. From there, the resilience in the equity market, we think, you know, in the last few weeks has really been driven by some of those earnings estimates finally catching up. The fact that you saw economic surprises be so strong really coming out of April uh, is mm -hmm. when economic surprises started to turn decisively positive because everybody cut their estimates thinking, mm -hmm. oh, we're having a recession. Then the economy was much more resilient than expected. So we've been in this very beneficial environment where you're continuously revising estimates higher for GDP growth. And that filters into, of course, for earnings growth, but earnings uh, estimates have really lagged uh, and they only started to turn higher in the last two weeks, which is probably one of the reasons why you saw a little bit of footing uh, in the market. So our view is that you probably won't see a deeper downturn in equities until you start to see a rolling over of those earnings estimates. You go from a revision upgrade cycle to a downgrade cycle. And so we're looking for signs that economic surprises are lo losing steam and that you actually have to start revising lower. Uh, and at that point, when you start to see those revisions take a turn or at least a second derivative turn, that's likely when you could see something that's more of the magnitude of a 10 plus percent correct versus the four and a half percent that we got in August. Yeah, I, uh, you know, it's a really good point. And I want to get to more specifics about earnings in a minute here. But I also want to just get your take on breadth and multiples as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things that you've heard this year is that it's been seven stocks that's been driving the entire stock market, maybe in NVIDIA, most famously leading the way and blowing everyone away by capitalizing on this AI trend and their picks and shovels business that everyone loves. And I'm curious, just you know, what you think about that argument Then I want to ask you about multiples and then we can get into some of the nitty gritty on, on earnings. Yeah. And I think we talked about this the last time we spoke, which is that breath is a really funny thing because it does make you uncomfortable. It can make you not sleep well at night when it is a very narrow market. However, Jeff DeGraff does the analysis that shows you when breadth is weak, 
what does the market do? Does the rest of the market catch up to the strong parts of the market or does the strong parts of the market catch down to the weaker parts? And his conclusion is that it's about a 50-50 split, Hmm. meaning that you it, breath has to be taken with a grain of salt. And so it, it, and it is very conditional to what's going on in the, in the rest of the market. And that we have seen, we have seen breath deteriorate over the course of August. Um, and what's interesting is we thought breath would improve going back to about June time. We said, Hey, you know, a lot of these parts of the market, like the magnificent seven and, and tech where we do have the leadership and concentration are very stretched. They're very overbought. Valuations are very extended. And from a longer term perspective, we do think that the market should broaden out. If the economy is stronger, more stocks should participate. The narrow leadership of of large cap growth is actually something you do see at the end of cycles because growth is scarce. And so you go into the areas of the market where you you have actual idiosyncratic growth. Uh, But saying, hey, if the economy is holding in better than expected, if you don't have a recession as quickly as as people are forecasting, then you should see better breadth. And for a time we did. June and July, we saw the equal weight, the average stock outperform the cap weighted index. Um, But over the course of August, it gave it all back. And um, but, you know, we'll see as we progress into September, because you are seeing some distinct shifts in leadership. Things like energy is starting to outperform in a way that it hasn't uh, really all year long. It was a laggard. Uh, it is now really showing signs of life. Um, the industrials, uh, you know, it started to do better. You're seeing some better performance out of classical cyclicals, which of course include tech. Tech is still considered in the classic you know, def- uh, cyclical versus defensive camp. It's mm. considered a cyclical. Uh, but I think the last point in that, just to note about leadership, is that one of the reasons that this whole kind of weaker, choppier part of the market has not been about growth, we can see evidence of that, not just by looking at earnings estimates or Atlanta Fed GDP at nearly 6%, but look at the leadership. Look how utilities and staples have continued to underperform. They underperform when yields went up. They underperform when yields went down. And that just shows you that there's not an appetite in this market to run for the hills and head for safety. When you start seeing those parts of the market, the classic defensives outperform in a significant way, it typically is episodic, meaning you get a big, huge stretch of outperformance, usually simply because they go down less. But people flock into those parts of the market when they do think that that things are going to get hairy from an economic standpoint, you're simply not seeing it, which would tell you it's about interest rates. It's about valuations. It's not about growth right now. Mm. So that that's a that's really helpful kind of peek under the hood here, right? Um, the, the last question that I have for you just is on, on your thoughts on multiples and relative valuation of the market. So I, I think it sort of reached its apex in July and has given back some of the, the multiples gains. But I mean, the looking at the S and P in July, uh, I think that traded at around twenty x, and the Nasdaq traded around thirty three times next twelve months earnings, which would be not on the crazy side, but certainly on the not cheap side. And I think a lot of folks were trying, like the expectation again going into this year, and I think it surprised a lot of people was we're withdrawing liquidity from the system. If anything, we should be plumbing lows in terms of historical valuations, and that's just not what we've seen. So. Just looking at like multiples and the expensiveness of the stock market in general, surprising to you right around where we should be. How do you think about that? Yeah, if if you had asked me at the beginning of the year, would you expect a new cycle high in real interest rates at 1.99% this morning and have tech valuations go back up to their 2021 peak on a forward basis? I would say that is a very low probability (laughs) and not something that is supported by historical data. Mm. And there's a whole discussion on real interest rates that I think is important and should be it should be had about what that means when I talk about you know why how kind of sounds a little bit dovish and what that means for real interest rates. But we can table that for a second. Mm. The 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 valuations, it's really important to define first what valuation metric you're using. I always use forward-looking valuation metrics. I'll look at backward-looking ones just for a gut check, but I'll use a forward 12-month valuation that's a blended number that smooths out some of the calendar effect of when you just roll forward your models 
Mm. right? This idea that is you progress through a year, you're including more of the next year. You don't want a cliff. So when you say, okay, I'm going to value on 2024 instead of 2023 numbers, always want to be looking forward and kind of using that rolling standpoint, that rolling basis. So when I say that valuations on the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ are at levels that have only been seen in two other times in the last 30 years, I'm using that that forward looking metric. There will be pushback where people will say, oh, well, no, you know, if you look at during 08, 09, when earnings were collapsing, you had valuations spike and your valuations typically go high at the beginning of a cycle. And the first part of a cycle is driven by valuation expansion. Yeah, on trailing numbers. And so if you actually look and, and are, are doing these forward looking numbers, what you can see is that no valuations do collapse uh, going into a downturn. They begin to expand. Uh, of course, the first part of a move higher is valuation expansion. But but never have they expanded to a prior high at the beginning of a cycle, meaning, you know, except for COVID, which was, of course, driven by you know, this incredible amount of stimulus and liquidity and easing that was put into markets. So there's only these two other times where we've seen valuations at these levels or above these levels. It was during the COVID bubble and it was during the tech bubble. And so maybe we are in a new valuation paradigm. Maybe we are in a world where because the, the largest parts of the market have the best return on invested capital, the best free cash flow, and they deserve these higher multiples, or we could be in a world where that was the narrative being given in 2021, where we're like, oh, well, of course we can value these things at, at new or you know 30 year high valuations simply because they're better companies. But of course, 2022 is the important reminder that when you start withdrawing liquidity, uh, there is a rationalization that happens to these multiples. So I would say that multiples are certainly in their high end of, of expensiveness. They're pricing in a lot of good news on the earnings front. And I think that they're also likely pricing in a lot of good news on the Fed front, meaning that you still have four to five interest rates cuts based baked in for 2024. And maybe the reason why they've been able to ignore the message from real yields is the market keeps going and saying, okay, what's one more hike? If I'm not getting cuts next year, I'm not going to derate something if I know I get support next year. And as that keeps getting pushed out, you know, for now it hasn't mattered to valuations, uh, but maybe eventually it does. I it, I think it's a good question and one of the things that we continue to to watch rather closely. Yeah, it's it's a it's definitely stumped a lot of folks for sure. And I think you summed that up extremely nicely. That the market has started to look through what it, you know. I don't think anyone cares about another twenty five basis points at this point. They're all starting to look through and say, when are we going to get some some relief? Uh, and it seems like based on multiples in the stock market, we kind of think we're getting our relief pretty soon, I suppose. And I guess we'll just have to see if that's justified or not. Yeah. And this is this is that that real rate discussion because if we if we look to the Fed and and what they're saying about why they would cut rates in 2024. The message from Powell and other Fed members is because of this kind of uh golden innocuous increase in real interest rates that would come if inflation moderates and they hold nominal yields the same, your real interest rate would rise, meaning that real interest rates are nominal rates minus inflation. So if inflation drops and your nominal interest rate stays the same, your real interest rate by definition moves higher. Now, there's two ways that you can define real interest rates. And this is our, if we could ask the Fed any one question, this would be the question that we'd ask them, which is what's your definition you're using for real interest rates? Because these two tell a very different story. The first one and, and the two definitions of real interest rates is just how you calculate the inflation. Mm. Meaning that you can either use observed inflation like the CPI or the PCE, or you can use implied inflation from market implied inflation expectations through what's called inflation break evens. They both have their weaknesses. Observed inflation is backward looking, of course. It tells you, you know, when you have a point in time, it's what happened the month prior. It doesn't tell you where inflation is going. And, and you're comparing it to an interest rate, which is by definition 
forward looking. Mm. Uh, but then those inflation break evens are very flawed because they're extraordinarily volatile, thin trading, there's no liquidity, and people will argue that they mean nothing. Uh, and so which one will the Fed use? Well, if we look at um, um, observed inflation, break e or, uh, real interest rates are only positive for the last three months using observed inflation, meaning that the Fed funds rate minus the CPI, the core CPI, has only been positive for three months, and it's at 0.8%. In prior cycles, we maintained real interest rates well above 2% for years prior to the, the tech bubble and prior mm. to the great financial crisis. So to argue that as inflation on a core CPI basis as it moves lower, we'll have to immediately be met with interest rate cuts because we're too tight. History doesn't necessarily support that because we've sustained much higher real interest rates for quite some time. However, then if we look at the, the, the area where it, real interest rates are historically high, which is using those inflation break-evens, the reason why they're high right now is because inflation break-evens already price in the Fed uh, being successful at getting inflation back to 2%, meaning the inflation break-even for the 10-year is just slightly above 2% and kind of back to its pre-COVID range, which means that all of the disinflation back to 2% has already been priced into break-evens. Mm. So either you use observed inflation and you're not that high and you haven't been that tight for that long, or you're using implied inflation and you've already priced in all the disinflation into those inflation metrics and you go, okay, if inflation falls, which one are you going to look at? Because real interest rates won't rise that much as inflation goes back to 2% because it's already priced in or you're really not historically that tight with observed inflation. It's it's super wonky, and but I, I, I think it is hypercritical because the Fed is using that as reason to cut interest rates in 2024 and say, oh, well, we'll have to because we'll get tight as inflation falls. And I think a definition from them and clarity is needed. And I realize that that's asking for a lot because when have we ever gotten clarity? What's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On The Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of BlockWorks Research. Now, many of you will probably be familiar with our platform, but BlockWorks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no-brainer. As a listener of On The Margin, and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount, and that gives you access to everything, which would be weekly in-depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So again, that's code MARGIN10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. So, Cameron, let me ask you, what's your sense of what the Fed prioritizes? Break-evens or just nominal minus uh, interest rates? They use both. They mm. flip-flop, mm. which makes me think that it's likely some kind of blended uh, metric that they'll use. And maybe they'll use the one that's most supportive of what they want to do with policy. So it's a self-serving metric? <laughs> Is that what you're implying, Cameron? <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. Um, all right. So... He used both in, in the Jackson Hole speech. He actually flip-flopped between talking about real interest rates uh, using implied and real interest rates using uh, observed. So my, my sense, if I had to guess, would be uh, break-evens is what matters more. Maybe that's a little bit of a controversial thing to say, but I tend to be in the camp of giving the Fed more credit than people mm -hmm. like to give the Fed. Um, and actually, I think they've done, relative to the historic curveball that they got thrown in the form of COVID, look, did they play it perfectly? No. Did they roughly manage everything? I guess we'll see, but you know, it could have gone a lot worse, I think, um, given what they had to deal with. And I think they they do have a more of a sense of markets than folks generally give them credit for. And I think they understand that markets are forward looking. So inflation expectations are important to them. So I would probably have to give it to break evens, but I, I agree. I think they use uh, sort of a mix of both. But um, I, I want to get a sense of, uh, you know, maybe talking about expectations around earnings. Maybe we could look at two of the, well, certainly one bellwether in the form of Apple, but then I'd love to get your sense of NVIDIA as well, because that's also a tale of two different earnings reports where they were both beats, but the big difference really was in terms of the expectation. So Apple had a beat on uh, earnings per share and revenue uh, in several of their key segments, but they were a little bit more measured in terms of projecting out their earnings going forward. 
NVIDIA, on the other hand, I mean, it's just the hits just keep on coming. Not only is it blowout on uh, revenue, but they keep raising their expectations and their guidance, uh, which is what's really moving the stock price. I, I guess my question to you is how much like which one of I guess they don't necessarily need to be the same, but which one do you see being more right than wrong? And specifically on the NVIDIA roller coaster, I mean, how long can something keep going up forever? Yeah. Well, function. they're also wildly different, right? So yeah. I don't know if if I've ever seen from Apple, and it's a good question of them reporting and having analysts be over 50% too low on the year ahead earnings numbers, right? And that's what happened with NVIDIA for a, you know, that that they actually had to revise estimates up by 50% going in this year and the next year because of completely missing the the direct impact of artificial intelligence demand on for NVIDIA. Uh, so that's a very unique case. And to extrapolate that to even other people who are in that ecosystem, you haven't seen other semiconductor players have that kind of delta, even if they might play into, you know, part of the ecosystem related to NVIDIA, they might create, you know, sell the equipment that that builds the chips. Nobody's seeing that kind of delta in, in earnings uh, growth. It raises the question to your point of how long can this go and for NVIDIA? And I wouldn't expect to have the same degree of upside surprise as you had in, I believe it was May of this year that caught everybody flat-footed. But then it raises, as you look forward for a name like NVIDIA, it's one of competition. Is there a replacement? How long are you in this arms race? Can you extrapolate recent growth trends? How long can they go? That's where all the, the analysts are, are you know, the semiconductor specialists are needed. One of the things I looked at is at what point, when we look at NVIDIA over the long run, at what point does this expensive valuation become a problem? Because it's always been expensive. And if we're only looking at valuations, you will miss out on names that do have extraordinary earnings growth potential. And the lesson from it is that the two years where NVIDIA has underperformed, and and I apologize if I I don't have the chart up in front of me. So if I misspeak just slightly, um, don't at me. Uh, But there's, there's two years where I believe it's 2017 and 2022 where NVIDIA underperformed. Um, no, sorry, 2018 and 2022. And both of these were times where you had down cycles in the semiconductor space. You actually had revenue growth um, uh, either flatline or turn negative. And it speaks to how it, as long as revenues are growing at a rapid clip, you can pay high price to sales multiples for companies. It's when they start to decelerate and that revenue growth doesn't justify the high price to sales that you tend to have issues. Now, for NVIDIA, they've been continuously able to bounce back, meaning that they've had resurgences in revenue growth, um, which then allows you to to, to kind of regain that high price to sales multiple. So if I'm an investor in NVIDIA today, I would want to continuously check the, the delta of sales growth, making sure it's still in my favor. So that way I can continuously justify a high valuation. It's when those two things turn kind of hit head on to each other, meaning that you have decelerating sales and the high valuation that you tend to have issues, but we're not seeing evidence of that yet. And that's again, where some people who are experts in semiconductors can talk about the competition in the space and all that. For Apple, it's it's a different story because it's it's far less idiosyncratic, far more economically sensitive, far larger, uh, and will not have the same kind of delta in its earnings uh, that NVIDIA will have because it's not seeing a step change in demand for its products. I'd say the other aspect is that Delta's operating earnings, or Delta, oh goodness, uh, Apple's operating earnings have been um, rather stagnant for some time. Uh, and it's been a lot of financial engineering that's helped from an earnings per share standpoint. The market hasn't necessarily cared, but then you have this whole feedback loop of, of indexes and, and kind of crowding into the larger names. So it's hard necessarily to compare the two because they are um, quite literally, oh, and I can't believe I'm going to do this, apples and oranges.
<laughs> that was pretty good. That was, uh, I'm giving you, a, this is a round of applause. So you did a dad joke. I'll do a dad thing here to give you a round of applause. Uh, Cameron, we got to wrap up here, but I want to ask you before we leave, it, you know, we talked about this in our last episode with Bob a little bit. And certainly going into the beginning of this year, of all the things that people got wrong, the recession call probably has to be at the top of the list for most, for most. Um and it's it's a it's a question that people have oscillated on. At one point, the you know the Bloomberg survey of economists was 100 out of 100 are expecting a hard landing, and now it's sort of transitioned into the soft landing or no landing camp. Where do you sit on the whole recession call? Is something on the horizon? Have we landed the plane without any bumps? I mean, where do you sit there? You know, I I've never really liked the land soft landing hard landing uh, framework because it mm-hmm. misses a very critical factor. And that's time. Mm. And that just because it's not happening today doesn't mean it won't happen. And that I've been to the camp that it's simply going to take longer because of all that dynamic of balance sheets that we talked about for recession to work its way through into the economy. And I, I would not want complacency to have this kind of boy who cried wolf moment where you go, oh, well, a recession's never going to happen um, mm-hmm. because look, we haven't had one yet. So that proves we're not going to have one. And then boom, right when that happens is, is you know, when you get that complacency, that's when people start hiring more people and building inventory and you get caught flat footed and you have your classic recession. I actually wouldn't rule that out as something that could happen in 2024 if we continue to see sentiment uh, start to rebound and people kind of breathe a collective sigh of relief. Estimates for recession, you know, continue to fall. And then that happens to be right when, you know, people do, you know, overbuy and and overstaff and, and the correction from that is what is what would cause, you know, a potentially cause a recession. I think if we if we look back on 2023, and I've been noodling on this, is this idea of of um, a, a, a financial cover of Don McLean, which would be the day the model died, which is what 2023 is, is that mm-hmm. models for recession probability absolutely died in 2023. And it's because of the distortions in the yield curve uh, from you know, the twos, tens being inverted for some time and, and threes, you know, uh, three months tenure being inverted as well, uh, which would have said, oh, a recession is imminent. It's definitely happening. And it didn't happen um, because of the distortions around uh, Fed policy and you know, with quanti- still the Fed balance sheet and all the overhang that might have kept long yields more suppressed than they should have been, which could have led to some of this inversion, as well as the rapid hiking cycle. Um, so you know that that sent a false signal. Then we also had the false signal from soft data, where sentiment data was terrible. Um, and you can go through the list of mm. consumer sentiment being bad, but retail sales being strong, uh, business sentiment being bad, but but overall uh, corporate spending and capex being strong. Home builder sentiment being bad, but home um, uh, construction remaining really resilient. A manufacturing sentiment bad, industrial production still resilient. On down the list, soft data has not lined up or predicted a deterioration in hard data yet. Um, at the the last part of why the models have died is because of the inability to discern between deterioration and data that is just a normalization back to trend because of all the distortions coming out of the pandemic all of the the collapses and spikes in different data points. And that normalization back to trend, if you're just looking at the delta, would have suggested that you're in a recession. If you're looking at rolling six-month numbers or rolling one-year numbers on a year-over-year basis, but if you're looking on an absolute, you're actually not falling below trend yet. And I think, and I want to try to, to... dig this through a little bit more is this idea that the models haven't been able to discern between actual deterioration that's usually predictive of a recession and just normalization back to trend. It doesn't mean that this normalization process that we're in doesn't continue and you get to the deterioration, but I think that's why you've had so many false signals on the recession side of things. So we think one is still possible, it's much it's 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 a 2024 kind of situation that we'll continue to monitor. Um, but trying to put a date on it, I think, is just unhelpful because the timing, of course, remains the biggest uncertainty. And as of yet, if I'm looking at the data today, I don't see one in the next 
three to six months. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can't have deterioration that could cause it after that. All right. Well, Cameron, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate your time. And I want to give uh, you the chance to tell listeners a little bit more about where they can find out your your research. And just, just to give you a little bit of a compliment uh, and show you, I, I find your the research that you put together, you have a real knack for zoning in on what I always view as some of the most important things uh, that are going on and have a very interesting sort of unique spin on things. So if folks want to find out more about you or your work or sort of read some of the content that you put out at New Edge, what's the best way to do that? Sure. So I, I, you can go to newedgewealth.com and under the weekly edge, that's where we publish a weekly note. And I believe you can sign up for it now and get it direct to your inbox. Uh, and the team, uh, and I put out a, a note every week and there's lots of different perspectives from different pockets of the market. So, uh, hopefully that can be helpful. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn and, and at X now, not, Twitter. Uh, so at, at Cameron Dawson, you can find me there. Uh, yeah. The ex Twitter, that's going to take a little while, but uh, Cameron, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you coming on and we'll have to do it again sometime soon. Wonderful. Thank you. 